much. Yeah, I'm going to go very quickly here. Uh, I'm not sure, or wasn't sure what I wanted to say or what specific audience I wanted to target. So I'm going to say many things to many different audiences. Hopefully something sticks. Um, and I also just want to touch base. Uh, Brian just talked about cost per smolt. Uh, we've actually done some recent work estimating the cost per smolt for different restoration scenarios. I'm not going to be presenting that, but that is essentially the theme of the two IMWs I'm about to present. Um, I, I work at Utah State and a group of uh, researchers there have been involved in both Bridge Creek and the Asotin. And one of the, the main things we've been trying to do is push this low-tech, um, cost-effective restoration. Um, other terms for it are let the river do the work, um, cheap and cheerful, there's other things that you might have heard. Um, and, and also we, we've developed a lot of tools um, to look at different responses at different scales. Many of these tools were produced by um, fund, um, the ISAMP project and BPA funding. And so I just want to give that sort of overview about the two projects before I get started. All right, so that my outline here, I'll just, for those who haven't heard the Bridge Creek story, I'm going to give you a really quick summation of the original story, which essentially ended in 2015 um, with the publication in 2016 of uh, the results. Now, I'll talk a little bit about the evolving story. Um, Bridge Creek is no longer funded as of uh, 2018 but uh, we're trying to maintain some data streams because we feel it's important. Um, and then we'll talk about what were the implications of uh, the Bridge Creek study and, and where are we going from here. Uh, just some takeaways before I get started. So Bridge Creek was a beaver-assisted success story. Um, a lot of people took away from it that it's a, a BDA restoration project. But um, it's really got more to do with beavers uh, than BDAs. Um, as I mentioned, this is kind of an example of ecological and process-based restorations, highly cost-effective. It's low-tech. You can train people to do this in a day. Um, and it's very scalable. And we think that's important. What we're worried about is that the mechanisms and maybe more importantly, the persistence of the response is going to be missed because it's not funded anymore, and so we're trying to fix that. And I try to make some important distinctions between BDAs, beaver dam analogs, and natural beaver dams, because they're not the same thing. All right, so this, this project took place in uh, the John Day watershed in Oregon. Um, the treatment stream was Bridge Creek, and the uh, reference stream or control stream was uh, murderers. And this is focused on uh, steelhead. Uh, the main limiting factor that was uh, essentially being tried to address is incision, very common across the West, down cutting of the stream channel, um, greater than two meter down cut in many places. And even after excluding cattle, so we're in 2009 here, we're starting to see um, vegetation response, a very thin, a strip of willows is, is establishing after cattle have been removed, but it's, the incision is still there. There was um, a small population of beaver. They were building dams, um, but the problem was is those dams couldn't persist beyond one year, basically. They were blown out by high flows, and that's where the beaver dam analog uh, method began. And so. The idea was if we can reinforce these natural beaver dams, then maybe they can uh, get a foothold and, and persist for longer than a year. Uh, this research resulted in a publication uh, in 2014 by Michael Pollack of NOAA, and he's showing here the channel evolution models of both natural beaver dams and then how you could use BDAs to simulate uh, natural beaver dams. And the important thing to take away here is that you can't fix incision without first widening the stream. And that's, in a sense, what both beaver dams and beaver dam analogs do by uh, failing, which is something that we're usually thinking of as a negative in the restoration world. But uh, in this case, it's a positive. 
Um, another paper in 2016 summarizes uh, the hypothesis and uh, the results of this study from 2005 to 2015 and essentially looks at how beaver dam analogs affect beaver and then what are the different things that beaver do to affect the physical habitat and the, the water and then fish populations. The takeaway from this from this slide is that um, there's four treatment areas. Those are the red dots in Bridge Creek, um, and the blue dots are controls on the main stem, and the green dots are controls and tributaries. So there's treatment and control within the treatment watershed, and then there's an out of watershed control that's Murderers Creek. And you can see the timeline here. Uh, we had at least Four, uh, four or five years of pre-data and then restoration in 2009 and we're monitoring it now. Uh, so the, the total treatment was uh, one kilometer, approximately one kilometer long. That was 114 BDAs, um, approximately 20 to 30 BDAs per kilometer of treatment. And the takeaway is that Prior to treatment, um, both natural beaver dams and BDAs are bouncing up and down at very low levels. And then in 2009, everything starts to skyrocket. So the dashed line um, with the little dots is the overall change in BDAs and beaver dams in Bridge Creek. And then the, 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 the treatment line is just the, the change within the treatment. and then. The other dust dash line is also showing the control. So the takeaway here is that basically beavers started uh, taking over both the treatment and the control. So we built 114 BDAs, and now we're at 250 BDAs and beaver dams. Okay, the responses um, were at quite immediate, um, over a meter of, de of deposition and pool formation, floodplain connection, um, this is just showing some spring flows, and then here's an aerial shot pre, we've got this single thread, and then after we've got ponds and anna branching and uh, much more diverse habitat. There's a paper coming out uh, fairly soon on the groundwater. Uh, it looks like we got one to three feet of groundwater um, response in treatment compared to control. We swamped out a whole bunch of sagebrush when we reconnected the floodplain and now have a lot more willow. And then the one that got everybody's attention is the fish response. Um, and we're using production here, which is the grams of fish um, per unit area and time. Um, if you times the abundance and the growth rate and the survival, I'm sorry, I don't have the percent change in growth, but it's negative compared to um, the control, but if you times those all together, you get 175% production. So that's that's awesome. That's the original story. Oh, you're giving me one time for everything. That's confusing. Uh, 36. Okay, I'm a, yeah. Um, all right. Uh, so what about the evolving story? So I'm going to talk a little bit about abundance, non-target species, barriers, uh, temperature, and um, one I added this morning. Um, a view from space. So this is a pretty standard uh, graph on the top. It's just the treatment stream, uh, Bridge Creek in, in the black and murderers in the dotted. And you can see that um, in general, murderers Creek had a higher abundance of, of juvenile steelhead before restoration and then after it flips. And so that's exciting. We've got a response and then at the bottom, it's the treatment minus the control. So when you're above zero, you've had a response, and when you're below zero, um, it's a, there's more in the control. So more, more fish in the control pre, and then more fish in the treatment post. Some people um, during the reviews of IMWs have uh, sort of characterized this response as, um, well, it's, it's gone back to pre, restoration conditions and uh, that's true if you look at that one dot but you know what we're more interested in is this mean response over time and it's still a positive and so there's still a, a positive effect and, and what's really more important is why
why are there some years when even after the restoration that the control has more fish? These red dots, and there's uh, one more back here, happen to coincide with the year after really warm years. And so we're speculating that the beaver dams um, actually buffered the treatment areas, and these dots would have been down where this pretreatment was if we didn't have beaver dams. But these are the kind of things we want to figure out. You know, this is speculation at this point. Um, another thing that we were worried about is uh, bycatch, and essentially, if we create a bunch of ponds, maybe we're going to get other species. And so on the top, we have uh, a, a, a group of species. Um, Sculpin, pike minnow, dace, etc. And then on the bottom, this is just a smallmouth bass introduced. We definitely don't want to see a lot of those. Um, so it looks like there are increases. Unfortunately, uh, for those that have done a lot of electroshocking, you generally um, get very focused on the target species and you're less interested in the bycatch. And so we have a group of people out there that were more interested in trying to record these in this blue area than they were in the, this area. So we're not sure. Uh, I think there still was an increase in these other species, but it's, that's one of the problems of trying to do a long-term study and have a consistent um, sampling approach. Just to make sure um, this is said over and over again, people are constantly worrying about beaver dams being um, barriers to fish. So this is pre-restoration. Um, there's 22 beaver dams just naturally occurring here, and 17% of the adults that entered um, were detected above these uh, all these um, antennas, so passive integrated um, antennas, pitag antennas. And then after restoration, we've now got 164 active beaver dams and numerous um, non-active ones, and we still see 29% passage. So we're not too worried about that. Um, temperature, we've, this graph shows uh, pre-restoration post and what we see is this dampening of the, the overall peaks in temperature. The average temperature at the reach level stays about the same but we're compressing the high so we're getting rid of some of the lethal temperatures and then this graph shows that we get more heterogeneity so each line is a temperature probe and so we get some that are flatlining at 10 degrees. That's essentially like well water coming out. And it's probably because of hydraulic heads created by the beaver dams that are pushing water down into the groundwater and then forcing uh, cooler water up. So we get heterogeneity too, so that's awesome. Um, and then this is a paper that just came out. Um, we're working with NRCS and Nick, Silver, oops, Nick Silverman's working with the Sage Grouse Initiative. The top graph here is showing NDVI, which is satellite imagery that tells you whether your plants are productive or not, like growing and healthy. And that goes all the way back to 1984. And they took a look at Bridge Creek, and they, you can see um, the treatment and control areas are bouncing around the same. The bars are precipitation, so as when precipitation is low, productivity is low. But here we are at restoration and the treatment is taking off from the control. So you can see this from space. This is sort of a mesic habitat response. And what's really cool is if you look at basically uh, sensitivities to precipitation, the, the further you are away from your original restoration, the less sensitive you, you are to precipitation. So, even in a dry year, you're still productive. So these are, these are cool things to see. Um, all right, what does this all mean? Well, the good, the good news or the bad news, depending on how you want to look at it, is that this project has sort of become famous. We've got international people. We've got movies, videos. Uh, school kids are into it. it that's all great. Um, it's being adopted, uh, as I mentioned, the NRCS has now latched onto this and is uh, promoting it as a way to also deal with the sage grouse issues. Um, but one thing that you need to know about Bridge Creek is that the restoration they did, four kilometers, that was the first 
um, implementation. There was supposed to be another one, a staircase, but it was unable to be implemented because of politics. Um, and the first implementation they did was in areas that were easier to restore. Um, so people are now going out there and going, well, I'm going to restore incised streams. Lots of incised streams look like this. This is a place I actually try working in. This is much more challenging than Birch, uh, the Bridge Creek. And I don't think people sort of realize the, that difference. Um, and the other thing is that people think, well, now all I have to do is weave some wi willows through uh, some posts and everything's going to fix itself. And so there's this uh, sort of temptation to make a very pretty, neat and tidy little wicker weave. Well, that's not what beaver dams look like. They're very messy, very complicated, and um, people don't sort of seem to make that connection. And beavers also don't use posts, and we, there's places where you don't need to pound posts, and we've been experimenting with that in smaller streams, and it works uh, just fine. One of those is a natural beaver dam, and one is uh, not, and I'm not sure which is which. Another problem is that there's always this uh, desire to over-design, and so people call these BDAs too. That's uh, corrugated metal in the middle there, um, and you know those kind of things worry us. But uh, the cat's out of the bag now, and you know people are going to do what they do. Um, I think the more important lesson that we can take away from Bridge is again, it's a it's a beaver story. It's not a BDA story, um, and this little story might sort of um, help clear that up. So this is a rancher that um, lives just in southern Idaho, just uh, half an hour away from the university, and he tried introducing beaver on his stream. It's uh, Birch Creek in Idaho. Very small stream, goes dry at, right in front of his house, and he wants water in there again, and he used to have beaver um, and beaver ponds. So he tried introducing beaver there, and then they just disappeared. He found Joe Eaton on the, online, um, and long story short, we built 25 BDAs in the stream, and then we reintroduced the beaver there. Now they have deep water habitat to protect them from predators. They start, then they're allowed, they enables them to establish, and he now has 125 beaver dams that weren't there before in three years. Two populations going in either direction, upstream and downstream from where they were released and he has water flowing in front of his house for two months longer than he's recorded in the last 15 or 20 years um, during you know, some severe drought. So BDAs are really cool and there's all sorts of things that you can do with them, but really this should be the goal, is getting beaver really established. They do the work for you and yeah, B BDAs need to be maintained if you want ponded water. At, beavers maintain their own dams. So that's that story. Oh, and this is just a net little anecdote. Um, there's a large fire, 70,000 acres in, in Idaho, close to the university. We went out and had a look at. This is a non-beaver influenced area, and uh, it just got torched. And here's a beaver influenced area, and I guess that slide kind of speaks for itself. You know, it's another reason this kind of stuff should be more common. All right, um, and the takeaways are what I said in the beginning, you know, that it's beaver, it's uh, not just BDAs, and these kind of approaches are cost-effective, scalable, and we, we need to do more of them.